Hello, everyone. Welcome to webinar number five in our prevention series. I am just messing with my screen here for a minute, pulling up what I need. Okay. Um, so while the rest of you come in, I think that the numbers are, are reaching up there pretty fastly. So it looks like everybody is populating into the webinar. Um, so again, I want to welcome you to the fifth and final webinar in our prevention series. This one is titled Marijuana Prevention, and we have a great lineup for you today. I am Amy Ronshausen. I'm the Executive Director of Drug Free America Foundation and the President of World Federation Against Drugs. WFAD is a multilateral community of non-government organizations and individuals who share a common concern that illicit drug use is undercutting traditional values and threatening the existence of stable families, communities, and government institutions throughout the world. The work of WFAD is built on the principle of universal fellowship and basic human and democratic rights. We believe that working for a drug-free world will provide peace, human development, democracy, tolerance, equality, freedom, and justice. We currently have over 330 member organizations representing 60 different countries around the globe. As mentioned, this is the fifth webinar in our prevention series, and the recordings of the four previous webinars can be found on the WFAD website. The prevention webinar series is done in collaboration with Carlton Hall Consulting. We are so grateful for this partnership and the work that Carlton has put in to make this series so informative and successful. We have four amazing speakers today, and uh, we will start the webinar with Dr. Kevin Sabet, who will provide our opening keynote and we'll speak for about 30 minutes. After this, we'll have time for a couple questions directed toward Kevin. After that, we will have a panel of three different speakers who will each speak for um, around five to eight minutes. And that will be followed by another period of questions and answers. Um, audience members can submit their questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, please use this rather than the general chat box um, for questions and answers or for questions because it'll be a little bit easier to monitor those. Um, but please use the general chat box to say hello, tell us where you're logging in from and any comments that you have. Um, but again, if you can, we will, we will monitor it, but it would be easier to find your questions if they're in the question and answer box. And then to uh, allow for a better flow of the presentations, I will start by reading short bios of all of our speakers up front, and then we'll begin with our keynote. Um, so just want to make sure everything is okay. We have to wake up. We've got Kevin's picture up there. Okay, so. Um, Kevin Sabet, an affiliate with the Institution for Social and Policy Studies and Medical School at Yale University, and dubbed by NBC News as the prodigy of drug politics, author, consultant, and advisor to three U.S. presidential administrations, Kevin Sabet, Dr. Kevin Sabet has studied, researched, and written about and implemented drug policy for 25 years. He is currently the president and CEO of Smart Approaches to Marijuana, also known as SAM, a nonprofit organization he founded with Congressman Patrick Kennedy and David Frum. His latest book, Smokescreen, What the Marijuana Industry Doesn't Want You to Know, is distributed by Simon & Schuster. He is the only person appointed by Republican and Democrats to work at the White House office, White House Drug Office and is a columnist for Newsweek. He has received his doctorate from Oxford University. So I will now read the, and I shortened these bios a lot, guys, so I'm sorry, just to save some time. I will read the uh, bios of our three panelists, starting with uh, Carlton. Carlton, is that, and is that the one that's on there? Let me just look, make sure, yes, okay. Carlton Hall is the president and CEO of Carlton Hall Consulting, a multifaceted full service consulting firm designed to provide customized solutions and enable measurable change for communities, organizations, families, and individuals. Carlton Hall has been providing intensive substance use prevention focused and focused in community problem solving services to the nation for the last 25 years. His responsibilities, unique set of skills and experience make him one of the most highly sought after instructors and guides for community problem solving in every state and territory territory in the nation, as well as internationally, with successful achievements in South Africa, Ghana, Bermuda, Kenya, and others. Our next panelist, 
George Ocheng Odala is the executive director and founder of the Slum Child Foundation based in Nairobi, Kenya. George has extensive experience in social work and working with and on the protection of slum children and youth. Growing up himself as a slum street child in Nairobi, George has dedicate, is, is dedicated to helping children with a similar situation and sees their potential. George represents the voice of vulnerable children in the global drug policy debate. And our final uh, panelist, Christopher Schmitz, is the founder of the Danish Network, cannabis therapist and author of the books, Teens Using Cannabis, A Guide for Concerned Parents, and the most important book you'll ever read about cannabis. And I can say that I, along with Kevin's books, I have read those as well, and they are, are, are really great. And I have read Christopher's book, and I cannot say enough about the Guide for Concerned Parents. I think it's a must read for all parents, anybody working on this marijuana issue. Um, and he also works as a clinician and has educated more than 600 therapists. So we will go ahead and start with our, our keynote. And so we have uh, time for that and then time for some questions after. Again, please put your questions um, in the Q&A box and I will turn the floor over to Kevin. Hello everyone. Thank you so much, Amy, for that kind introduction. And it's really an honor to be on with such, um, you know, uh, friends and, and people whose work I really respect. Obviously, Amy at the Drug Free America Foundation, one of the longest uh, uh, tenured organizations in the world working on drug issues. Um, yeah, you know, Carlton, been a longtime friend, doing incredible work in, in prevention for really his whole life, uh, almost in his whole adult life. And um, it's great to see Cressida and Regina. And I echo what Amy said about Chris, uh, Christopher Schmitz's book, which is really a must read. It's something that I, um, you know, we've been promoting at SAM and different places and think it's a, it's a wonderful uh, resource and guide. And then, you know, of course, great to be with George, who, you know, is really uh, in a place that's far less resourced than I think the, where the rest of us are and uh, just doing, you know, really God's work there uh, in saving lives and which is not easy at all. So it's, it's really wonderful to be with you. And, and so many of the panelists I see, I, you know, I'm a sort of honorary Canadian now I'm living temporarily in Vancouver. So it was nice to see people from uh, Montreal, bonjour, Melissa. Uh, as well as um, Sweden and Mexico, and I'm going to talk about Mexico a little bit this morning, morning for my time, and uh, from really all over the world. It's an honor to be with all of you and really with the work that WFAD is doing, which is just such critical, such, such critical work. So I'm going to share my screen uh, and hopefully you can see that. And uh, just very quickly, for those of you that don't know, Sam, Smart Approaches to Marijuana, uh, we promote an evidence-based approach to marijuana policy that prioritizes public health and prevention. We were co-founded when I left the Obama administration with um, Patrick Kennedy, the former congressman. Um, we are a nonprofit, like I said, organization that educates citizens and promotes health-first smart policies and attitudes that decrease marijuana use and its consequences. We're honored to work with multiple uh, reputable public health authorities because you know, what we found is often in prevention, the science of what's happening is not often translated into language that the average person can understand. And so it's, uh, it can be frustrating for people in the field who, who know the science and know the work but it's frustrating because it's not really being, you know, diluted or not diluted, but um, going, you know, trickling down to the average person. And so that's really what's important. And I've tried to make it my life's work to do that. I wrote a book, some of you know, right behind me actually called Reefer Sanity, Seven Great Myths About Marijuana. And then I wrote this book, Smokescreen, recently. And I'm going to highlight a little bit from Smokescreen during the talk today. But Smokescreen was really an in-depth um, book that took me many years to write, as opposed to my first book, which I did very quickly, um, because it was really like an investigative report on what is happening in the United States, because you can just imagine what a mess it is. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, incidentally, tomorrow, I will be early, uh, my time around uh, 5.30 a.m. Pacific or 6 a.m. Pacific, which I think is closer to four or five uh, European time, I'm going to be interviewed uh, for a Swedish conference by Linda Nilsson. And if any of you want to join that, please let us know. I'm sure we can get a link to you, but I'm going to be talking much more about the book tomorrow morning. I think the key thing in prevention when it comes to marijuana or cannabis, whatever you want to call it, 
uh, is that we are not talking about the marijuana of the past. See, people think they know about marijuana mainly because they're basing it on their own experience, which is really a folly. I mean, I know somebody, I just heard yesterday, in fact, I think Corrine, who's on and doing wonderful work at the Institute for Behavior and Health, Bob Dupont, uh, with, of course, founding member of WFAD, mentor to so many of us, uh, told a story yesterday. We were all talking about a person who uh, said that um, they know somebody who was in a car crash and wore a seatbelt and couldn't get out of their car. So they're never going to wear a seatbelt anymore because they know somebody that wearing a seatbelt was became dangerous for them. Um, you know, it's tempting to want to base, you know, something on someone's experience. We've heard a lot about this with the global, with the COVID-19 pandemic too. We've heard people say, well, I know somebody who was in close contact with somebody else that got it and they were fine, you know, something like that. But it's not looking at the actual data because data and research give us the relative risk. They give us what is most likely to happen. Doesn't mean it always happens. So if we base our behavior on something that, that is not the risk uh, factor, but is actually something that happened once or twice, but is in the minority, we're really gambling there with our own safety. So we hear people say marijuana um, was what, it, you know, I remember using it, or I know somebody who used it and they're really successful now and they're fine, but they're not understanding that that's not the old, it's not, we're not talking about the old marijuana, we're talking about new marijuana. And if you think this is only a United States thing, it's not, this is, these things are now found all over the world. And we're talking about the ice creams, the sodas, the candies, the chocolates, all of the things that are essentially there to attract, let's be honest, young people, because that's when addiction starts. I mean, prevention is so important. It's the most important leg of the stool of, of what we can do. Why? Because if we can prevent people from starting to use drugs before they become adults, they are unlikely ever to use. And if they do use or try in adulthood, they are very unlikely to have addiction. And, and someone said to me once, well, what about the prescription drug epidemic we've heard a lot about in the Western hemisphere, the issue of pain pills. There weren't a lot of people who never had an addiction. They were overprescribed. Maybe they had an injury. They were overprescribed an opiate and they were addicted. Yes, that happened. But remember, the vast majority of the, even those people who were adults when they became addicted, they actually had a prior addiction that they may have overcome or they were still working through. It wasn't that the vast majority of them had never had an addiction and then they were overprescribed pain pills and they became addicted. I was overprescribed pain pills 20 years ago for a shoulder injury, um, but I was much less likely to be addicted because I'd never had an addiction. And when I had one OxyContin, I didn't like how it made me feel and I got rid of it. Um, well, I didn't have a prior addiction, so I was at very little risk of getting a very, very little risk of getting an addiction. Why? Because addiction starts when you are young. It's a pediatric onset disease. It's something that why prevention is so important and why marijuana is so important in this conversation, because kids are not exposed to fentanyl laced cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine as the first drug of exposure. They're exposed to alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana. That's why these three, and again, the, the, the great work that IBH is doing on one choice prevention, that's why these three are critical because you're very rarely going to have a kid that says, I don't drink, but I'm going to smoke a lot of marijuana, or I'm, I don't smoke marijuana. I'll never do it, but I'm going to drink a lot. It's often, these are all together and it is all about prevention. If we care about the addiction issue, you know, one of the analogies that can sometimes be confusing, but I think is very helpful. Um, if you want to think about the typical marijuana user of the past in terms of the amount of THC they're consuming, that's like they were consuming the caffeine found in one bottle of Coca-Cola versus 33 Starbucks Grande Cappuccinos, okay? And that is the equivalent of THC the average user is ingesting now is 33 coffees. It used to be one Coke, now it's 33 coffees, okay? That is a huge multiple orders of magnitude difference 
in terms of the amount of the THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana. That's what gets you high. Marijuana is a very complex plant. There are hundreds of ingredients in it. THC is the one that attaches to certain receptors in your brain and body. That's what gets you high. And, the, and if you look at the typical user, especially in the Western hemisphere now, they used to be consuming the amount of you know, active ingredient found in a Coca-Cola. Now they're consuming found in 33 coffees. Huge difference. We don't really understand the long-term implications of that difference, but I can tell you it means we're not talking about the person who smoked a joint now and again 20 or 30 years ago. And what's made this worse is we now have the global juggernaut of the tobacco industry, which is a bigger industry than Microsoft, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, and Starbucks combined. Combined. We now have them in charge of different parts of the marijuana industry without it even being federally legal in the United States. Imagine if it would be to become federally legal, what that would do, what that would do in Europe, what that would do in Africa, Southeast Asia. Of course, tobacco is very active in Africa and Southeast Asia because they've been pushed out of North America in many ways with the exception of the um, with the exception of va vaping, which is a huge issue, obviously, which they're also very involved in now. Um, they used to be the alternative, you know, vaping was the alternative to smoking tobacco. Now the industries are all combined and they are now taking over the marijuana industry. And I'm not going to go into the, all the details about how they're taking it over, but you can see, and I'll leave my slides with you as well. Um, if you're interested in learning the specifics, we've actually done some digging and it's all in my book as well. But if you go to learnaboutsam.org industry profiles, uh, you'll see some profiles of some of the bigger industries and what they're actually doing. And they're targeting our youth. Of course they are. Because again, it's all about youth. It's all about young people. It's all about getting them young. Even if it's not legal for them under 21, they still want to target them. They're doing this in billboards all over the United States and the different states that have legalized. They are equivalent it to joy and happiness, fun. Of course, this is appealing to youth. It's cool, it's fun, it's chill. I mean, this is exactly the playbook of big tobacco. They're even copying some of the, um, of the uh, mascots. I mean, look at Joe Camel there with uh, the, the Corova mascot. I mean, that looks pretty similar to me. Well, again, that's because they know what works and they're going to go with what works. And they're all over social media. And this is happening in every country. Even if you don't see billboards in your country, your kids are accessing social media. They are sponsoring comic conventions. They have cartoon characters. I mean, this is the real deal. This is really about hooking young people as young as you can. Um, and it's not about social justice. I talk a lot about this in the book. So I'm going to shift gears right now a little bit. Um, we, we know that whether it's Compton or whether it's the slums of Johannesburg, this is an issue that targets the one people that are the least, um, connected to society that are the most disenfranchised and the poorest. Why? Because they have fewer resources to work against it if they need to. Um, and so you have these marijuana companies essentially um, targeting lower communities of color. Um, and by the way, in the United States, we have more people arrested for alcohol than all drugs combined. Why? Because it's legal. And, and when it's legal, more people use it, more people get in trouble with it. Just because it's legal in your country, if marijuana is legal, it doesn't mean that there's no issues with it. It means there's going to be more issues with it and actually more issues in the criminal justice system. And we're still seeing disproportionate arrests. This is not getting rid of all of you have heard of the movement of social justice, Black Lives Matter, a lot of the, you know, uh, movement regarding um, um, equality is, that has really become a global movement, but started, you know, in, really in earnest to about a year and a half ago. Uh, and what we've seen with that is people saying we need to allow marijuana for because of um, to get rid of the disproportionate arrest rates, but it's not happening. And by the way, people of color are not benefiting from legal marijuana. I just want to make that clear. And, and you might be thinking, what does this have to do with prevention? Let me tell you something. Young people will be persuaded by these messages before they will be persuaded 
by the message that marijuana is harmful. I wish that wasn't the case. I wish young people said, well, wait a minute, it's bad for me, so I'm not gonna do it, I don't wanna do that. Some will do that, but when you talk about an industry targeting them, that is much more effective from a prevention point of view than when you lecture them about the harms of marijuana. Now you should still talk to them about the harms. They need to know that uh, marijuana is uh, gonna could reduce their IQ by eight points. It could cause psychosis and schizophrenia, all of these problems. But they probably will be persuaded when they see how unjust and how this is about a corporate movement. And by the way, how we still see an illicit market for marijuana in the places that have legalized. I'm not gonna go into detail, but a key point is that we were gonna get rid of the black market, the illegal market, we're not getting rid of it, we're making it bigger. And that's what's happening. And I think also when we talk about prevention and we talk about policy, we have to separate issues. I mean, whether you sort of think that they're good or not, we have to separate the issues because legalization can be, not always, different than decriminalization, which is different than medical, which is different than prescription marijuana. In the UK, there are three prescription medications based on marijuana. That's very different than what they sell at the beach in Los Angeles on a, at a dispensary. That's not the same kind of medical marijuana. We have to make sure we disentangle these issues. It's very, very important. Right now in the United States, the, the move to legalize marijuana has hurt young people, it's hurt everyone. And we have 10 times more than that, as many daily users of marijuana than we did 30 years ago. Um, that's a major concern. And we're seeing these rates rise in Canada. We're seeing them go up in Europe. We're seeing them go up in a lot of places. And I think that's very concerning because this is about an addiction for profit model. And, and again, young people are smart. You know, you should talk to young people about how, um, you know, this is an issue of, they don't need everyone to become, to use their product regularly. Even if they only have 20%, 20% consume the majority of their product. So they need that 20 to 30% of users to keep using very heavily. That's all they need. They don't need everybody to use heavily. That's a really important point, I think, for young people too. Um, we have seen that it's uncontroversial though to talk about the danger. So I'm not saying don't bring up the danger. You should bring up the danger, but we should do it in the, the way I do it is in the backdrop of saying, don't take my word for it. Listen to the Surgeons General of Republican and Democrats. This is Biden and Obama's Surgeon General. This isn't just a right, left, conservative, liberal issue because you know I, I know a lot of countries in Europe, we see certain left parties, radical left parties talk about legalization. That should be a platform. And we have seen that. Unfortunately, it's become more partisan. In Canada, it became very partisan with, with, with the current prime minister. And that's too bad because it should not be a partisan issue at all. Um, and so we need to understand that it's about science. And I tell young people, do the research yourself. Research it yourself and don't take my word for it, but use legitimate sources. Because if you do, you will find that these problems are happening. We're seeing poison control calls, poison centers go up in the states that have legalized because these kids, as little as one year old or even younger, they're eating these edibles that are just lying around. They can't tell the difference between, you know, a a candy, a candy, which they probably shouldn't be eating either, or a THC infused candy. So it's really important. The other issue, you know, I was talking about this, but you know, again, when we talk to young people, I want to appeal to their hearts, and I think it's really important to appeal and talk about how, um, you know, public housing, for example. When we look at this, it, the, the poorest people among us are being affected. There was recently a study of New York City um, public housing talking about you know a 13-year-old, okay, a 13-year-old okay, saying it travels down the staircases, it's in the elevators, it's in the hallway, it's downstairs inside the lobby. I mean, you know, this is affecting young people and poorer young people disproportionately. And, and these are major, major research projects by major hospitals. So two thirds of residents smelling marijuana in their house, that's a major hazard. We learned our lesson with second and third hand smoke but we're apparently we didn't learn our lesson well enough because we're seeing this now with marijuana. We need to remind people it's no different than tobacco. In fact, it might be worse to inhale from what the science is actually saying. So it's really, really important that, to emphasize that. Um, you know, 
the other part of this, we know about secondary prevention and tertiary prevention. If primary prevention doesn't work with everybody, in other words, if we weren't able to prevent it among young people because they've legalized, we can still make it a little bit better. We can restrict the THC concentration. We can disallow the marijuana industry from serving on, on rulemaking bodies. We can try to disallow advertising. In the United States, that's very hard. Thankfully, in other countries, you have more tools to do that. Um, and if you and, and in places and in jurisdictions that have not legalized, you know, we don't need to be jailing. I don't think we are in most places in Europe, especially jailing people with low level amounts of marijuana. But we should direct them to treatment and intervention. If this is a health issue, let's treat it like a health issue. We wouldn't have somebody with a cold say that if you have a cold, we're going to just forget about you and, and not give you the resources you need to get over your flu or get over some other health disease. So we need to absolutely talk about that. I wanted to, uh, I was asked earlier to talk very briefly about what's happening in Mexico because it's very confusing. We're seeing this, obviously what happened in Canada, it happened federal legalization happened a few years ago, but in Canada, they're also still working through basically court ordered legalization, okay? And it hasn't happened yet, but we're very concerned about it because first of all, the current prosecution for serious crimes to actually convict someone is less than 10%. So the idea that they're, we're going to be able to go after the illegal market if it's legalized, I think is very, very, very difficult. We know that criminal groups will likely extort the, the people that are actually trying to play by the rules legally. We know the police resources will be stretched. And I think what's going to happen in Mexico can be a proxy for other middle-income countries around the world because when you don't have a lot of, I mean, in the United States, it's a mess and that's the richest country in the world, okay? So in a middle income country, imagine in terms of the, you know, culture of compliance, regulation and law already being low, uh, this is gonna be very, very, very difficult to contain. And I'm just very, very worried about it. Um, we're not gonna see Mexican drug traffickers go out of business. I think we're gonna see turf wars, we're going to see infiltrating the legal market. That's what we're going to see. We're not going to see the criminals now say, oh, we're going to just let this all go to the legal market. No, of course not. And we have to remember about how the underground market and the mafia is working in Central Europe, how it's working within um, Africa, especially West Africa, how the deep ties within Asia. The idea that if we legalize, that these things are just going to go away is ludicrous. And that's something we need to bring up when we talk to policymakers. By the way, how did Mexico legalize marijuana? Well, I'll tell you, it started with a few activists funded by billionaires who want to legalize all drugs. And so when you were preventing marijuana, we're actually preventing the overall widespread use of all drugs. Okay. It's not just about cannabis. It's about all drugs because there is a movement driven by billionaires globally that want to legalize marijuana and all drugs everywhere under the sort of improper that this is about a failed war on drugs. And, you know, I'm in Vancouver right now. I'm in British Columbia. If you look at the overdose deaths in British Columbia, it's worse than in the United States. And I thought coming from the U.S., we had the worst. It, we don't. This is a place that gives out heroin, methamphetamine, and cocaine on the street packaged and legal. This is what this very extreme harm reduction. And, you know, we can use the term harm reduction in a specific way to get people into recovery, okay, to get people to a place where they can get into recovery. That's very different than the kind of very extreme and unfortunately a lot more commonplace harm reduction that we're seeing, which is really just about mass legalization and handing out not only needles anymore. It used to be about handing out needles. It's not needles anymore. It's handing out drugs. It's called it safe supply because they claim it's not tainted with fentanyl, so it's safe. Well, that's not keeping people safe. That's causing a lot of these problems. Um, and again, I connect that to this issue of Mexico because it was a couple of activists in Mexico that brought this court case that made them legalize marijuana. And that those folks and all of this were funded by the same people who are trying to do the same thing all over the world um, and legalize all drugs, not just cannabis, okay? Um, if you wanna learn more about what's happened in the US, we have a free resource on our website, learnaboutsam.org, it's called Lessons Learned. 
Um, I'm going to skip this. You can get involved with Sam. Please email us. We do a lot of work internationally as well with our partners, and we would love to love to have you involved. So I'm very happy to take any questions now. I wanted to make sure I stayed under 30 minutes, and um, I think we just um, need to understand that we cannot give up on this fight. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Kevin. Yes, we do have a couple questions that came in. Um, but first, I just want to mention a couple takeaways that I had that I found really um, important to reemphasize and and just say that I, I always learn something new when I hear you speak. And I love the visuals that you give us and your ability to put all of that, like you said, the data and the research and put it into a way that the rest of us can understand so that we can say it back in our communities so that we can teach people. Um, you know, one of the things that you said is about young people being persuaded by these false messages of the other side. And I think we need to remember how important youth are in, in our efforts. Um, and then you said that the poorest among us being impacted the most. And this is exactly what prevention is all about, making sure that we are protecting the most vulnerable in our, in our local and global communities. Um, so I think that you've given us a, a lot of information there. And I, I want to reiterate to everybody how important it is and what a great resource it is that Kevin has given us with his um, most recent book. And that if you have don't have it or haven't had the opportunity to read it yet, that I really highly recommend that you do that because it gives us everything we need to have these conversations. We lost you, Amy. Or I lost you. Of course. There you um, go. Back. Okay, I'm back. Okay. Well, I was saying how important it was for people to get your <laughs> Thank book. You. Um, so hopefully it's up. The next question, and it looks like I do have an unstable connection. So great. Um, I will I will pose these questions and hopefully they'll go through. So the first one is how is medical marijuana different from the shelf marijuana that is sold yeah. in uh, you know probably the black markets? Yeah, well, so there are many kinds of medical marijuana, if you want to use that term loosely. I mean, it's just, first of all, the term we should say was also an invention. I mean, it's a very brilliant invention. It's a PR move. When you put the word medical in front of something, how can anyone disagree with it, especially if you tout out cancer survivors and patients? I mean, it's amazing how effective that term was. But the word, when you do medical marijuana, so in some countries, I mentioned the UK, there's also the US, Canada, some other places, there is legitimate uh, derivatives or synthetics. It just kind of all depends on which drug you're talking about, but based on marijuana plant, okay, that's used with a very specific dosage for very specific reasons as a medicine. And I don't think anybody here would disagree with any of that. That's a medicine that's gone through the regulatory. That's great. But then there's the med medical marijuana that is being sold unregulated in shops they claim it's regulated because they, they have you know, a way to regulate it. If you read the book, my book, you'll see that it's not regulated at all. You don't know what's actually in any of these products, okay? Because very few places are gonna actually legitimately legalize smoking a joint and test every joint on the shelf. They're not doing that. And then you have the street marijuana. And guess what? The street marijuana is no different than what's on the shelf in California if you go to a medical dispensary. It's really, there's no assurances, there's no greater assurance with the shelf marijuana versus the street marijuana. So um, again, that's the irony there is there's no difference there, but if you look at the actual medications, none of which are smoke, none of which are in edible candy form, those can be legitimate medications, the sprays, the um, uh, pills, those can be legitimate medications because they've gone through the proper regulatory bodies. But the stuff on the street is often no different than the stuff in these pot dispensaries you may see when you visit the US or when you go to, I mean, I know Austria has some, obviously many other countries have them as well. Okay, and then we have another question. We have two more questions, so I'll, I'll try to get to both of these. Um, one of them is, what do you see as the biggest loss for marijuana prevention efforts to reach young people during the pandemic, which therefore now absolutely needs to be yeah. given a priority. Yeah, I mean, so that's an interesting question because it kind of assumes something correct, which is that, you know, there's only so much time we have in front of kids and, you know, we have a global pandemic. We're racing to make sure, you know, we have a third of new infections in the UK or from kids. So kids are clearly an issue. Um, 
What's interesting though, is that there is a connection between marijuana and COVID-19. There was a big study just done finding that break, what they would call, which I don't think they're gonna call anymore, but what they used to call breakthrough infections, meaning if you were vaccinated and you got COVID-19 anyway, they said that marijuana in, out of all the drugs was the biggest risk factor in terms of, re, in terms of a breakthrough infection. In other words, marijuana users had the highest rate of being infected with COVID-19, even if they were vaccinated. That's pretty compelling. And I think we should talk about that with young people. Um, but in terms of the sort of opportunity costs, we have to be mobile, we have to be agile. I mean, Carlton's probably done this better than anybody. And during a pandemic, we have to be able to do virtual. We, and honestly, virtually, we can sometimes reach more people. So it's, that's, there are positives with that as well. Um, but I think talking about it, even within the context of the pandemic also makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. By the way, just real quick, someone said medical cannabis instead of medical marijuana. You know, again, it depends on what you're talking about. Can I don't, so cannabis is a term a lot of people use. Certainly it's the accepted term in Europe and a lot of the, a lot of the world. Um, you know, to me, that sounds like a very legitimate medicine when you say cannabis. So if you want to talk about the legitimate medicines that are approved by regulatory bodies and talk about medical cannabis, I have no problem with that. But I would never call something, you know, off the shelf in one of these dispensaries medical cannabis, because that makes it get that and to me that gives it more legitimacy than it needs. Sorry, did it too no, Great, great answer. Um, totally agree there. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and put it over to the panel. Kevin, there was a question on the QA about THC Delta 8, Delta 10. That's probably a whole nother presentation on it. We'll send a link. I will send a link about Delta 8 and 10 and the, and the isomers uh, because we just did a one pager on that. So I will be happy to send a link in the chat box. People can read one pagers. The other question about the thing tomorrow, I'll, I'm going to try and get a link and also put it in the, um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the chat box too. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. And then um, Cressida or Regina can make sure that those links um, are in the follow-up email as well uh, under the resources. Um, so now thank you. I will thank you very much, Kevin. It was a great presentation and great resources and a lot, lots of good information for all of us here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the uh, panelists now, and I, I will pose the following question, and um, I'll give it to Carlton first to answer and to um, expand on what Kevin says or, or whatever else that he wants to talk about. Um, but what do you have to add to the topic of, of Kevin's presentation from your own experience, role, and perspective? Uh, so Carlton, we'll turn it over to you first. Fantastic. Thanks, Amy. Uh, and thank you, Kevin, for an extraordinary presentation and for doing just what we all knew you would be able to do in, in conveying um, the seriousness and the urgency of the times that we are in and putting it in a way that, as Amy mentioned, um, provides us all with tools and information and education to be able to help uh, the communities that we are all serving. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of time because I just, I wanna build on what Kevin shared uh, but provide maybe just a couple of ideas uh, for folks to consider along with that. And so if you don't mind, I will share a couple of slides. Hopefully this will work. So folks, let me know. Um, Amy, are you seeing my screen? Um, yes, just came through. Okay, hold on a second, let's see. Uh, are you seeing uh, my PowerPoint? Yes. Fantastic, fantastic. The only thing that I wanted to share, and these are things that I learned actually from Kevin and the great folks at SAM, as well as from um, some extraordinary heroes that Kevin already mentioned, Dr. Uh, Bob DuPont, Dr. Bertha Madras, uh, but the point of the matter is what's the difference? I, I will share with you that part of what has been my driving force uh, is that um, it, after being in this field for over 25 years, um, my wife and I became grandparents uh, for the first time. And as such, uh, for those of you who um, have that experience, you know what I'm about to say. You know that your entire perspective on everything 
changes as a result of those grandchildren. I um, had uh, my son uh, uh, and his wife gave us our first grandchild, Ethan, and then 10 days later, my daughter gave birth to twins. And that's right, if you're doing the math, we went from zero to three in just 10 days. And those remarkable creatures actually began to inform the way I then viewed the work that I was doing. Um, why? Because when I went to uh, uh, their parents' home uh, to be able to spend time with my grandkids, um, I found that uh, their entire environment had changed. I found that I could not navigate stairs. And because even though I have a couple of degrees, I could not figure out how to open up the, the, the grate that they would have in front of the stairway. And when I went downstairs, I couldn't open up a cabinet because the cabinets were secured in a very particular manner. And I couldn't charge my, my, my phone because all of the electrical outlets were all had this, this child proofing that took place with that. That is because the population that was prioritized in the context of that environment was the most vulnerable population, right? And there was no doubt about who was priority in the context of that environment. Well, what they did very effectively is what preventionists ought to be doing. They are taking the invisible dangers and making them very visible, very obvious so that we might be able to prevent harm. And so here, what I wanna share with you is based upon what Kevin just offered, what's the difference in what it is that we are now looking at and that we are considering. And there are some invisible dangers that I believe that we have a duty to inform our society about. Number one, there is a distinct difference in the potency that has been a part of what it is that is now available and accessible in the context of the times that we are in. Um, some um, reports indicate that retail marijuana has probably 70 plus percent THC, if not higher, uh, in much of the sales that are going on. In a very real sense, folks don't know what it is that they are purchasing. This has presented what I would refer to as an invisible danger for our society and particularly for the most vulnerable minds, our, our most vulnerable uh, brains within our society, which are our young people. Secondly, um, all of the science indicates that anytime you change the delivery mechanism, the delivery methods, you also increase the opportunities for misuse, abuse, uh, and then addiction uh, that can come as a result of that. And by virtue of the various methods, we are no longer talking, as Kevin mentioned, we are no longer talking about the person that enjoys a joint every now and again. We are talking about these delivery mechanisms that are now putting our young people in greater harm because again, no one knows in this unregulated system that we now have, no one knows what it is that they are consuming in terms of this. Um, we are recognizing that this has an important relationship with a growing and emerging danger that's associated with our young people, and that is vaping. Um, Kevin mentioned that, and that there is an increased danger that's also associated with synthetics. Um, uh, we've had in the United States more than 93,000 deaths associated with overdoses, and more than 70% of those are occurring, or the greatest majority of those are occurring as a result result of synthetics being associated with this product. All of this is aligned with what Dr. Uh, Bob DuPont, um, a hero to both uh, Kevin and mine and, and Amy, I'm sure everybody here, one of the founding members of Wafat, um, who have brought us all together, um, has um, coined as commercialized recreational pharmacology. And here's just one anecdote, one um, story that I can share that in, illustrates the invisible dangers that I believe are, are uh, representative of the things that in all of our nations we have to attend to because we are looking at the in 
impact of commercialized and a commercialized push uh, towards all this. That's really the driving force behind the legalization movement that's occurring in our in all of our communities. Um, I was walking in New York City, and as I was walking in New York City, I saw this 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 beautifully colored bus or truck uh, that was there playing some loud music, and and it and it kind of brought to mind the the ice cream truck that I used to remember when when I was a child, right? And that you'd have the ice cream truck, and and they would come by playing music, and all the kids would come running and and this lovely young lady stuck her head out the window and she said these words verbatim she said hey guy don't be shy come get high i got your gummies i got your candies i got your lollipops don't be shy come get high and I looked at her and I gave her a slight smile and I just simply said, can I take your picture, please? Uh, but all of that is simply to say that when I had the opportunity of, of looking into this, the fact of the matter is, is that on this truck, they particularly aren't sharing anything or serving anything that has a TH value that would actually get anyone high. They're actually selling a lie. But the notion here is that they're not really, the purpose of this truck is not really to get people high, is it? The purpose of this truck, in my view, is to normalize this, right? Is to normalize this. And the one thing that I want to share, the idea that I want to get across here is that normalization equals invisibility. How many of you will agree with me that some 15 years ago, even, even less, uh, a, a site like this would have been unheard of, but it's becoming even more and more commonplace. Why? Because the more they normalize it, the less we see it. And what was even more impactful about this is that when I was walking along this street, there was a young woman that was walking behind me with her two young children in tow, and the young child screamed out to his mother, mommy, 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 can I have some gummy bears? Can I have some gummy bears as we were walking by this truck? The goal of prevention is to make the invisible visible. That's what it is that we are charged with doing. Because in a very real sense, what is occurring is that there is a huge, huge shift that is happening. Uh, Kevin already mentioned the fact that we are now seeing a great increase in the number of, of those that are reporting marijuana use disorder. This is information that I was able to be able to um, um, share from Dr. Bertha Madras. Um, but what we are talking about here is that this danger is going unheard and unseen unless we make it obvious. And so I just wanted to offer that as a notion that part of what it is that I am compelled to ask of all of you is to consider your role and how we begin to make these hidden dangers, these invisible dangers, much more obvious, much more blatant, much more overt uh, in our societies. How do we make these invisible dangers visible in our society? And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen I'm going to share, ask uh, and, and look forward to hearing from our other panelists. And, and Amy, thank you so much for your great leadership. We appreciate all that you are doing as well at the helm of WFAD, as well as the Drug Free America Foundation. Looking forward to the conversation afterwards. Thank you, Carlton. And, and thank you for those important takeaways. I just love making the invisible visible and that prevention has to be intentional and obvious and can we make our prevention efforts as obvious as the marijuana marketing in as the industry has made marijuana marketing and wouldn't that be amazing and how can we do that and with the group of people we have here and the group of people working on these issues i think it's something that we can do we just have to come together to do it and with that i will turn it over to our our second panelist Looks like George is getting ready. And George, I'll turn it over to you. And here, here you go. I, 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 think, I think my colleague was to go fast. <laughs> so I don't know if he's ready or I just proceed. You just proceed, George. Yep, go ahead, George. 
uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving me the, the opportunity to, um, to be one of the speakers here. I have seen uh, a lot of friends joining all over the world and uh, they would really want to know uh, more about what we are talking about. And uh, I'm happy for the good presentation made by Kevin. Uh, uh, I really, I call I call him as my mentor because uh, he, at times when I get stuck, he I run to him and ask him, how would you mentor me when it comes to issues of marijuana uh, advocacy and lobby? Uh, Carlton has also done a good job uh, talking about what uh, the experiences and so on and so forth. So for me, I'll just talk about a little bit about the Kenyan situation, which is more or less not different with uh, what uh, we have in the world. Uh, next slide. Uh, I wouldn't want to put a lot of emphasis on uh, uh, much about our organization. Uh, I, 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 can't, I can't take it to the next slide, uh, but it's fine. Um, where, where, where the slides will, 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 will find us, we'll proceed. So uh, I will not talk about much about our organization. Uh, I'll just encourage people that uh, if you have time, you can log in slamchildfoundation.org. You'll read more about us over there. But uh, talking about the drug situation in Kenya and um, most of the information uh, that uh, uh, I will be sharing cuts across uh, the entire continent, you realize that um, we have the, the, the national agency that coordinates issues related to drug and substance abuse in, in, in the country. And in their recent finding, the, the 2018 finding indicates that alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana tops the list of drugs that are being used by, uh, by, by, by most of the people. And um, they also contribute to death uh, of these young, uh, I mean, uh, millions of people in Kenya. Uh, you also realize that uh, uh, cannabis, cannabis is also the most preferred narcotics. And um, uh, allow me to relate uh, to uh, uh, two cases that I had today in my office. I had two women who came literally crying that my son has been using cannabis. I don't know how it came into being, but I mean, uh, how can you help me? And if you do a random, uh, random sampling, you also realize that uh, uh, cannabis is preferred and um, uh, by it, it's preferred by most of the young people and um, the cartels are using all possible means to ensure that they lure young people into using this. And I'm so sorry to say that uh, they also use the, the so-called Rastafarian movement to ensure that uh, they push for their agenda. Uh, if you look at the survey that was uh, was done in, uh, in, in 2016, uh, this, the, the, the drug situation is rampant uh, in high in schools like uh, today i also had another case of uh, one of the members of the board of management in one of the two public schools in korogoto whereby they were telling us that uh, they've recorded like every week they must have a case of uh, i mean almost three cases of children between the ages of 10 to 15 who are being caught with marijuana I mean, it's not it's not a good thing to share, but that is the reality and the sad story about what is happening. It is accessible to every single person uh, within the slum setup. And if you look at uh, the number of people who have used drugs in Kenya, it's all it's it's on the high end. Right now, we are talking about uh, 4.9 million. I mean, people who have ever used drugs, but at the same time, we're also talking about 3 million drug users those who are addicted into this. And uh, my good friend, Susan, uh, Susan Gitao is also here and uh, she, she's, uh, she, she can, she can uh, bear me witness. You realize that uh, in terms of facilities, we have inadequate facilities that can be able to, to help us treat uh, these young people who are really suffering. It's treatment in itself, it's very expensive. But uh, there is something that the government is doing and uh, the civil society are also doing. Uh, this has also been uh, contributed by a number of factors. Uh, next slide. Uh, and these factors are uh, issues of parental responsibility, uh, which is very, very much high. Um, uh, we, we are talking also about issues related to gender-based violence. Uh, I'm in my next slide. So issues of poverty, very, very high. I mean, look at, uh, look at um, a case scenario of where I work or go to slums. 
uh, issues of uh, uh, drug consumption is very high. And if you if you dig deep, you realize that the most common use is drug is is marijuana. I was in the western part of Kenya. I mean, people are using drugs. I really I I I I I, I shed tears listening to the stories of the young children talking about how drugs has really affected their, fa their their parents they're like george is there a way we can be assisted i was in the central part of kenya like last week and the same same story repeats itself and i i, I think i have even consulted nakanda is it possible for us now to start alcoholic anonymous not even narcotic anonymous to help the, the, the families just be able to find themselves out of this problem. Uh, look at the basic needs. It's also a problem, peer pressure, accessibility of these drugs, because I'm so sure if it can be locked in a way that the children cannot be able to access it, um, it, it can be, I mean, it can bring a relief because if you look at um, the science behind uh, the, 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 the human development, um, uh, mind development, the the, men, the 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 mind grows up to uh, around 23 years so if this child starts using drug um at the age of 10 by the time they will be 23 i don't know if they will have their brains or not a case scenario of a woman who came to my office and she was complaining the son has been using drugs for the last 10 years so 10 years the child the, the son is right now i think uh 23 so that means the child started using marijuana at the age of 13. So, I mean, it's 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 painful when you when you listen to these stories and 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 and, and the people talking about them. I mean, they really don't have help. Uh, uh, being idle is also another another factor. I don't know how we will be able to solve this because we we are kind of trying to find a way. I mean, you tell someone that try to create some that can help this person be busy, but uh, that uh, they're able to do this. Look at uh, uh, lack of role models. I am George, I work in, in Korogoto slums in Nairobi County. I cannot divide myself and be in Central, be in Western, be all over. And this is the same, same scenario in other countries. Look at, uh, look at uh, I've been to Uganda. Uh, Natete slums, it, it is more or less the same. Uh, I've been into in Tanzania, it's more or less the same. I've been into, uh, I mean, uh, I've had cases uh, in Soweto, in Nigeria. I mean, the young people tend to believe that uh, uh, these are, uh, 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 I mean, they're, they're, they're given the wrong information that the drugs that they're using are more of medicinal, I mean, it's not factual uh, to them because the way they're, they're using, they're looking at the medicinal part of it is completely different because for example, the Rastafarian guys, they, 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 they say it's a hub, but a hub that treats something that is not clear to them. I mean, you cannot, my belief is you, you need to use, um, you need to get a medication to treat a particular disease. We lost George on everybody's end or just mine? Yeah. On everybody's end. Okay. Um, I guess what we will do, oh, and now he's disappeared from the screen. So he's okay. back. He's back. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what has happened with my connection again, but uh, I'm, I'm, it's fine. So uh, we also lack mentors. I mean, we don't have people who are who will who will be able to help us take things to the next level, or looking at role models that can mentor us to the next uh, level. But um, we will still do our level best. If you look at uh, the effects of this, uh, the effects of uh, of uh, I've, I've, I've called it drugs in general. Uh, it has led to school dropout. I mean, uh, health-related problem among young people. R nowadays, uh, mouth cancer, throat cancer, stomach cancer, it's very, very much common among these young people. I mean, my next slide, uh, school performance has gone down. Crime rate has increased uh, 
at a, at a very high rate, uh, especially during this COVID, it was worse. Uh, cases of teenage pregnancies, cases of divorce has been on, on, on high end. But uh, as, as much as we are saying this, uh, we can't say that the government has not done anything. We've had people uh, uh, championing for, for this. And I keep on asking myself, are these people living in our world? I was in Colorado at some point and, and, and the scenario that I saw it was quite painful looking at young people who are very energetic, but they've turned out to be zombies. People who are praying for death, death in the next minute. That is the same, same scenario with the people that we, we, we meet around, around here. Next slide. Um, you, you realize that you, you, you meet young people who have lost hope completely. And as much as the government is trying its level best, I, I think we, we need a consolidated effort. The government has to play its part the civil society has to play its part, but at the family level, which is the most important part, every single person has to do something. As much as the government is being firm on issues related to legalization, uh, it is fine. But again, at the grassroots level, what are we doing? Corruption dominates every sector of our society. People are caught with those roles of bang. Uh, people are, are, are being are told not to do this, but they do this. So long as you're able to bribe a policeman, I mean, you're able to find your way. Um, uh, we've been given chances to contribute to different policies at the country level, regional level, international level, but policies without action does not really make sense. Um, I'm so sorry to say that I, if, if, if you analyze the documents that come from, from the CND every year, I'm so sure that there is, uh, it, it is around uh, between 40 to 60% are being, people are implementing this, but uh, that is the state parties. They are implementing it around 60 to uh, 40 to 60, but the, 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 the other percentage, people don't consider taking action because like in Kenya, we have the best policies, but implementation is zero. Uh, I, 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 I really love the, 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 the multi-agency team that worked it out. And in Kenya, it worked out because we were able to ban Shisha. If you look at the regional uh, task force that was put in place, Rwanda was the first, Kenya took the, 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 the initiative and other countries followed the same. Uh, again, this is just uh, as much as the government is doing the, 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 the the surveys, there is still a big gap in terms of what the data that is on the ground. And we don't really, if you don't have a data, there is no way you can come up with an evidence-based uh, 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 intervention. But again, the government has really tried to ensure that uh, they provide the, through the National Health Insurance uh, Cover, I'm, I'm so happy that uh, Carlton and the team have really supported a few of uh, 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 young women uh, from Krogocho slums to be able to get this so that they're able to get uh, their, their medication. But uh, as much as that has been done, I mean, we, we also need a lot uh, of uh, efforts. It is not a one-man show, but it's a consolidated effort. As much as the government is doing its part, we also need to do a lot uh, with the provision of resources from different level and to ensure that we are able to uh, get what we, we want. Uh, to, to my next slide, uh, which I think is should be the last or next to the last, uh, I would uh, really encourage the world and, and, and especially Africans that we need to embrace primary intervention. I have seen it myself. Uh, prevention, I believe, works. We started a, 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 a narcotic anonymous in Korogoto slums. We've not taken, we started with around 50. We've not taken a single person to a rehabilitation. But so far we are talking about seven who have decided that they are not taking drugs completely. They, uh, I don't know how, they have re rehabilitated themselves. So I believe it works provided you put the right mechanisms in place. Uh, still, we will advocate and we will keep on advocating that uh, legalization should not find a space in our society. I'm so sorry to say that it has really landed me in, in a lot of problem. I've received a number of threats uh, because I am kind of interfering with other people's business. But that, the reality is we will not sit back and see drugs being legalized in our country in the name of their people who want to make profit out of it. 
I'm so happy with what Kevin uh, has been doing, moving from the US to Canada and different parts of the country. And that is the same, same footstep that we will put ourselves into. We would rather die and not see these things happening to our children. I wouldn't, I wouldn't find it good to see my daughter uh, being exposed to drugs in the name of someone wants to make uh, a, 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 a profit. Then the coordination of CSO uh, working on prevention has been on the forefront. We are really trying our level best and I'm so happy with WFAD. We have a regional forum whereby we keep on uh, pushing for this. Uh, then having uh, the rapport between the civil society and the government has been on the forefront because Kenya will lead by example and I hope the, the, the countries within the region will also take the same and, and ensure that um, we get the best. Uh, as much as we are facing challenges, I, I recently I saw uh, Uganda uh, signed a deal with Germany that they are exporting marijuana. I don't know for what purposes. Look at South Africa. I mean, it 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 needs a lot of lobby and making noise and making noise until these people get the sense, and we are able to challenge them with the facts. And I'll conclude by say by reading this in my next slide. Uh, let us educate our children. Uh, let us educate our children to understand the truth that will help them live a life set free from now and in the future. So that is all I have for you guys, but uh, marijuana is a big problem. Drugs is a, a big problem within our society. And if we cannot consolidate all our efforts together, it's not, it does not need money. Even a piece of advice helps take things to the next level. It's not only in Kenya, but the entire region. Thank you very much. And that is it from my end. Thank you, George. And, and thank you for the work that you're doing in your part of the world and know that it translates globally. And that, you know, every life that you touch there, that you're providing a safe space for these kids, that you're providing hope for them, that, you know, they then in turn are reaching other kids and you're doing such a great work with that work there. And I think one of the other things that you said that is so important, I think a lot of the things that you touched on that's happening in Kenya, we can relate to all over the world. I, I noticed that some of the things when you were talking about them are, are things that we've heard from our colleague Diana in India and others around the globe. Um, but you really emphasize something that I think is important for us and, and things that we talk about a lot. And that's really the importance of working with policymakers to make sure that even in places where there are good policies, that those policies are being implemented. And in places where the policies aren't great, that we're educating those policymakers to make sure we're putting things in place that put public health and safety first. So thank you for that. And now I will uh, turn it over to Christopher and we do have some questions coming in. So we'll have time for those um, at the end, but first let's uh, hear from Christopher. Well, thank you, Amy. And uh, thank you for all of you guys, uh, the brilliant work that you do. Um, Kevin, to, to, uh, to what you said, uh, you didn't mention it this time around, but uh, I've heard you earlier on say, this is not your Woodstock weed. And, uh, this is indeed the case, and it is a defense of the young people's brains, not a war against drugs. So I'm going to use the time here to, and thank you for that, just to let you in on the secrets of Denmark, what's going on in the Nordic region in, in Denmark. And uh, one of the things that I guess you need to understand when we talk about Denmark is that it's practically legal here and I might get some uh, might get in some trouble saying that but uh, of course in a, it's not in a sense of a, uh, it's legalized but you can buy it off the streets um, and the thing is we got this place sort of a in in midtown Copenhagen uh, the capital we have the society within the society it's called Christiania and it's a tourist attraction and uh, you can basically uh, buy cannabis right off the streets and I mean it's no secrets that the uh, young kids from yeah Denmark but even I guess the Nordic countries are traveling to Christiania to uh, to try out cannabis so 
we we kind of got it on the shelves already and uh, so you could say the problem is here um so this uh, this society uh, consists of what 600 souls but but it's really connected with cannabis sale and a lot of uh, uh criminal activities and uh i guess the problem is that Besides that, that the politicians are very nervous for the voters because you you have this social experiment uh, who's been last which has been lasting for several years and I guess it's not going to be shut down. Uh, and on the other hand, you got this serious problem with cannabis uh, being sold uh, sold off the streets. So politicians are kind of trying to balance on a knife edge here. On one hand, they want to support the social social experiment. And on the other hand, they want to, you know, stop the selling of cannabis and other things uh, off the streets. Um, one of the problems uh, in Denmark, and I guess in the Nordic region, probably all over the world as well, is the rhetoric, the way we're talking about this um, this substance, and uh, you mentioned it, Ken, uh, Kevin. It's 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 kind of story based. It's anecdotal. It's uh, it's uh, pseudo science, you could say, right? So so it, it isn't really fact based, and that's that's what we're trying to. Uh, that's the task at hand. So uh, we need to inform better, and we need to challenge that rhetoric that, that's going on at the uh, politician level, but also at the societal level. So we have a big, um, a big task there. So I'm, I must say that I'm <laughs> now and again amazed that the politicians are not uh, fact-based and I mean, this might sound a bit uh, strange, but but they are really listening to the voices. Uh, I guess they should of the voters, but but they're kind of buying in of the story that's going on in the communities. And so you you have this situation of no one really introducing fact to the discussions. And I guess you could say you're entitled to your own opinion but not to your own facts. And that's kind of the problem here. Uh, and the, the problem, I mean, I'm a clinician, so I work with, uh, with, with cannabis addiction, obviously, and, and are teaching other clinicians. And what we see is that this kind of uh, loss of facts within the discussion, um, trickles down to the uh, to the therapists. So they kind of buy into the same uh, myth. And um, that means when, when we get the young people in treatment, we kind of reproduce the same uh, myth. And that's a big problem. So you could say when, when they finally get into treatment, we kind of uh, enforce the myth that are already existing. And that's a big problem. So that's where I'm putting my, my weight these days. I'm really trying to inform these, uh, these clinicians uh, to do a better work. Um, yeah, um, I guess that's it. Just, just one number here uh, to let you know, uh, you could say the, the, the size of the problem. So 95% of adolescent uh, people under 18, 18 are um, getting into treatment because of cannabis. 95% of people under 18 in Denmark. So that's basically everyone coming through the door who says that cannabis is the main substance abused. That's the reason for being here. So we got a lot of work to do and I'm, I'm really, really honored to be here and I'm excited for this work and uh, hopefully uh, we can push forward. So uh, thank you. Great. Thank you, Christopher. And I, I think that you said probably what a, a big takeaway for me is 
probably one of the most important things is we can't forget that we have to continuously educate our professionals and that they are not immune to this false rhetoric and the things that were being heard. And so as much as we're educating at the community level, that education has to continue in our professional associations. So the work that you're doing to educate clinicians, I mean, it's so important because like you said, if you're not, if you're not doing that, it's just a, a reoccurring theme and we're not giving this population the, we're not informing them the way that we need to do that. So thank you very much. Um, we do have a couple questions come in, so I will, uh, let me scroll up because they're in the chat, so let me just find them here. Uh, so one of the questions was uh, to Carlton, it says, what do you consider to be the most necessary results that must be achieved by prevention measures in order to obtain the desired results of drug prevention that will benefit young people? <laughs> if you can give us that information, we've won everything. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, let me give it, give it my best shot. Uh, <laughs> um, what, I, what I can hear in the question um, is uh, that there is, I think, an important um, um, area of work that we in prevention need to consider uh, if we're going to improve our impact or effectiveness. I think first and foremost, I think one of the things that we can do is, is be, be rigorous in really considering um, the, the idea and the concept that um, uh, the Institute for Behavioral and Health uh, has promoted um, uh, with the one choice messaging and one choice campaign. And the reason why I think that that's so valid, and this is for those that don't know, is the um, very, very clearly identified, clearly articulated message that everything that we do through our prevention efforts should be geared towards one goal. And that goal is that no one under the age of 21 should engage with any use of alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, or any other illicit drug for reasons of health. And the reason why I think that is so impactful is because it provides us a very clear guide towards what are we doing and, and it lends itself to helping us as we're engaging beyond ourselves to do ver four, four very critical things. One is to clarify our message and our messaging and our efforts in a way that folks will be able to easily understand who we are and why we're doing what we're doing. Two, it helps us to concretize what it is that we're doing so that we can identify our strategic leverage towards making change. And lastly, it allows us to engage for folks outside of our typical circles, um, to be able to speak in a language that, that normal people speak, right? It's instead of all of this preventionese kind of conversations that we typically have. So if I were to, to provide any thought around the question, I would say, if we could begin to organize ourselves in a way to incorporate that one choice messaging uh, in a way that clarifies our efforts and our activities, I think that would be very helpful. Great, perfect, perfect answer. And you know, it, it makes sense because if, if research and data shows us that 90% of addiction uh, starts in adolescence, you know, capturing them at that point and having them make that one choice really helps with all of our efforts down the road later on and, and minimizes the amount of work that we would have to do. Um, uh, George, if you're there, yep, I see you. Um, a, a kind of a similar question. What has been the most effective measure or strategy that you've been able to implement in your organization that's been geared to reach uh, girls and young women? Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for, for the question. And um, I will answer this in two ways. Uh, one, we, we have been trying our level best to come up with a uh, um, women empowerment program. Uh, and I'm so much uh, grateful to uh, the, the, the friends of the organization uh, who have been able to help us have a catering facility for the, the young girls to be able to gain the basic skills. And uh, recently we also introduced uh, the tailoring classes whereby they, they are able to gain skills that can help them uh, take things to the next level. I mean, be busy and avoid being idle in a way that 
are not think about engaging in drug and substance abuse. And we've seen it very effectively because most of the girls and young, uh, most of the young girls and women who are into this uh, walk home with a skill that can help them be self, uh, self-reliant and provide for their children and families. Uh, although of late it has uh, had challenges because uh, you, we cannot uh, charge for these skills that we are giving out to them uh, uh, because they can, it, it's very hectic for them to afford. So, but uh, we are very much grateful that they've been able to gain something and uh, they have skills that are helping them also start some micro, I call them micro business skills uh, that can help them generate something. Two, uh, as we have uh, said, we have been employ- uh, we have been uh, working on um, a child-friendly model. We, I call it uh, uh, Slum Smart Ambassadors, and it has been very, very effective for us. Uh, we've seen it work out uh, with the young children, children between 10 to 15 years. We bring them together and educate them, empower them, and ask them to become ambassadors uh, amongst their peers. And uh, they are able to share the, the right information to their peers and talk about issues related to drugs. I'm so sure that in the next 10 years, if we will be able to maintain this generation with the right information, we'll be able to uh, to break the generation gap of information that, uh, of wrong information that uh, the, the young people get uh, when it comes to issues related to drug and substance uh, use. So uh, I think I've been able to share it out. And again, looking at that, we've been able to train teachers on the same and we are looking forward. In Kenya right now, we have, I think, three clubs. And uh, very soon, uh, I'm looking forward to, we are looking forward to have more of this club being replicated in different regions. And uh, most of the regions that I visited recently, we are working on something that uh, based on this model, I know we will sophisticate a few, one, two, three and uh, we will be able to have something better that will be able to help our society. Yeah. Great. Thank you, George. Thank you. That was good, good answers. Um, I think that it's important to remember that, you know, substance abuse prevention isn't just about providing information on, on why drugs are bad, that oftentimes it is, you know, teaching skills Um, so that people can have a better life and have something that they can um, earn money for and get out of the predicaments that they're in. So that's perfect. Um, We have a question here for Christopher. Um, Out of the numbers that you showed, that you told us about, do you have any demographic information on that? Do we know like how many of those represent girls or or boys and the different different things like that? Yeah, so thank you for the question. I will provide a, a specific link to, to answer that question uh, because I think it's important. But we generally say that four in every five people are male. But uh, I'll get back to the specifics uh, of the question. Okay, perfect. If you can just send that link to um, Cressida or Regina, they can make sure that it gets put into the follow-up email. Absolutely. Okay, and then it looks like we have a one one last question that we have time for. And it is for Kevin and it says, uh, what causes you to be optimistic about our cause and all of your experience with the leaders you engage with at your level? Well, I have a lot of reason for optimism. Uh, First of all, we know what we're doing is right because we're in the business of saving lives. We're in the business of, (laughs) we're in the business of, we're in the business of giving people their lives back and saving lives before they, before, you know, anything bad would happen. Um, That's what we're in the business of. We're in the business of having people live their best lives. Some people will tell us that drug use is just a personal choice. It's just a behavior. And we're all drug users because I drink coffee and you had Coca-Cola. And so everyone's a drug user and it's all the same. And we know that that's fundamentally wrong. We know that that's not true. We are trying to protect souls and have people understand that they can live a life for their full potential. That to me is the biggest inspiration we can get. And I, I've said this before, I don't know if it's gonna take five years, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, 500 years for people to realize that, but they will realize it. And it may have to be after some painful, painful experiences. It may have to, it may have to be after things in the world getting much, much worse before they get better, but they will get better. 
Um, you know, I can read the letters I get from people, not the, you know, eight mail, which we all get, I know, but the letters of hope from people saying, thank you, your information saved me. Um, you know, I used to think what you said was wrong. And then I did research and I found out for myself. And now I'm teaching my little brother. I mean, we get, we all get these things all of the time. So we are in the business of hope. If that's not inspiring, honestly, I don't know what is. And I'll tell you one more thing about leaders and other people. I can't tell you how many people have told me and big time leaders, politicians, we all know, have privately told me, you know, I can't get in front of this issue, Kevin. It's politically toxic for me, but you are doing the right thing. Please keep doing it. You have to keep doing it. And I'm telling you, that is constantly reinforced. So all of us together, we are going to do it. We are doing it. We got to keep going and never lose hope because that's the business we're in. Thank you. Perfect, Kevin. And uh, thank you, Carlton, for posing that question because I think that was a perfect uh, one to, to, to leave on. Um, so I will just have a couple closing remarks. I want to uh, thank Kevin, our keynote, and thank Carlton thank and George and Christopher for being here today, sharing all of your knowledge and experience. Um, I want to share a few things with the attendees to add to, that will add to this great conversation and resources that have already been provided. Um, so the first is to remember that there were four other um, prevention webinars in this series, and those can be found on the WFAD website. Um, also, there's a recording of our most recent global advocacy training that was titled Navigating a Changing Marijuana Landscape. Um, that was done in partnership with WFAD and Drug Free America Foundation, and that link can also be found um, in the follow-up email that you will be receiving because it's on YouTube. Um, and during that webinar, we discussed a lot of the things, the action items that were talked about here today, um, advocacy itself, its opportunities, best practices, and strategies. And then the last bit of information I want to share is uh, really just a summary of our recent Nordic Summit. So on September 27th and 28th, we had the hybrid, hybrid Nordic Summit in um, Copenhagen on cannabis. Um, it was a very successful event. Uh, we had many people attending, you know, in person, but an awful lot of people attending online. Um, during both days, research and expertise on various aspects and risk factors on uh, marijuana were shared. Um, but most importantly, one of the things that I want to tell you about was during the summit, a white guide was disseminated. Our speakers at the summit contributed to this white guide, elaborating on research, reflections, and recommendations on the topic. Those facts were integrated into a white guide, and that can be used in your efforts in education and advocacy and the work that you're doing in the future on, on this topic. And that link um, I will share in the chat box now, but I will also uh, it will also be included in your uh, follow-up email. So um, another important document to have at your ready for uh, different things on this issue. Um, so I wanna thank each and every one of you for taking the time to log in today and be here with us. I look forward to seeing you again virtually very soon and hopefully in person soon as well. Until then, please stay safe and healthy and continue the great work that you're doing in your communities, both at the local level and the global level. Thank you so much. I appreciate each and every one of you. Have a great rest of your day or night. Thank you.